So, um, we're both doing an internship at the moment. Yes. Yeah. At schools, at the same time, same thing. Well, so, n- yeah, not the same school, just to be clear. That would be epic, though. <laughs> that would be fun. Yeah. So, just quick, I don't know much about what you're going through. Are you doing it alone or with a partner? I'm just doing it alone. It's just me. Okay, I'm doing it with a partner. I'm thinking it was a big mistake. <laughs> uh, I yeah. don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but this guy, I'm doing it with a great guy, lovely mm-hmm. guy, everyone loves him. Uh, he's doing physical education, and I'm doing uh, history, philosophy, and uh, social sciences. Mm-hmm. So, uh, he has like uh, two lessons a week. I have 16 lessons a week. Mm-hmm. Um but we have to plan everything together and it gets really frustrating when you watch someone being like, oh, I'm so stressed out from planning three lessons a week and then you're planning 16. I mean, anyway, mm. uh, yeah, no, but so. Um, 16 is a lot even for a full, fully employed teacher here, I think. It is a lot here too, yeah. The, the average in Denmark, I think, is 12 or 13 lessons a week, but it's, yeah. it's, it's my own fault. Because I'm, um, I chose to do more classes than I had to, mm. just to get a feel for it. Because I don't know if I want to do social sciences or um, uh, f- um, history. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I just chose both. I'm actually also considering doing German, because mm. it's really easy to get a job if you can teach German classes. Yeah. If I would choose to be a teacher, it's very easy if to get a job doing any language. Uh, if you are educated, like if you have a license to teach it. That's Not funny. English in Denmark for some reason. Uh, mm, or Danish. Well, English te- There's a bunch of English teachers for some reason. Interesting, yeah. No, I think it's, it's fairly easy to get a job as an English teacher here. Um, yeah, they're very aggressive. That's the funny thing. I think we talked about this on the pod before. Yeah. Uh, that, um, yeah, they're very aggressively going after language majors uh, in uh, Danish universities. Mm. Uh, from Sweden. Sweden is the Swedish government is trying to hire people from Denmark to go to Sweden and teach. Yeah. No, no, we have a massive uh, shortage of, of teachers and it's it's because being a teacher sucks. Like we have to work like 45 hours a week and we get shit yeah. pay and we get stressed out and we have to work from home because we have like five to ten hours of you know planning that we have to do at home. Which is like part of our job. Like we are employed to work at home for for a certain amount of time, and and mm-hmm. we have to deal with kids all day, and and it's very a very stressful job, um, and we don't really get anything for it other than I guess summer vacation, which is nice. Yeah, it's it's very rough. Like a lot of people are very rough on teachers, uh, and a lot of public employees in Denmark are very angry at teachers for getting a pretty good salary compared to other public. Uh, workers but at the same time you do have to keep in mind it's not just being around kids all day it's also trying to get them to learn something and being pressured by yeah. your school and the government uh, to demonstrate that you're teaching them something all yeah. the time it's not just going into a classroom and teaching something it's justifying every lesson you're doing both yeah. verbally and in written form it's like what what are you going to be teaching them what materials are they going to be using what materials are you going to be using why yeah. are you doing it what are they going to learn from doing it? How are you going to demonstrate that they learned it? How is it going to help them in the future? How does it meet the goals that, you know, te- like students should? Like you're filling this stuff out with every lesson and then mm-hmm. you're doing like 14 lessons a week or 13 lessons, however many. It's mm-hmm. a lot of work, especially for young teachers. We don't have the most strict requirements about documenting everything. I think it might actually be our unions which have helped us there and, and saying that, you know, as long as we as long as we help the students reach the goals which they should meet uh, and, you know, reach, you know, passable grades, uh, then we're allowed to not document exactly everything that we're doing. Oh, okay, interesting. I know that, like, I've spoken to the people that work at the school and they say that uh, the documentation is very intense uh, mm. in, in Danish schools, at least. And I think it's a general European development that teachers do have to document everything more extensively to prove to politicians and the schools that they are, you know, doing everything that's required of them and, mm. and, you know, you know, justifying exactly why they're doing what they're doing. And yeah. no, we, yeah, we don't really have that rough. much documentation. Uh, I mean, we have some of course, but not as much as it sounds like you have. 
Yeah, it's it's a lot. It's a, it's it's it takes a long time to just like sometimes this this week as we were writing out all all the documents and forms we had to fill out. It gets really it's it's a it's a strange. T- Have you ever seen that um, what they called asterisk and obelix go to the bureaucratic office in yeah some yeah. French town where they're losing their minds? It does feel like that because when you're do- like it doesn't sound like a lot, but imagine filling out the same form. Um, 14 times a week mm-hmm. using pretty much the same wording but challenging yourself to make them sound different because you know it's the same people that's going to be reading the forms mm-hmm. and you do, you, they're, you're told to not copy paste anything and to fill it out every time so imagine do it, like doing that 14 times a week every week mm-hmm. that is intense we've been how long have we been in practice i think we've been in practice six weeks now and I, I was literally getting sick to my stomach as I was filling it out this week because I was like, because I, I had to, I had to plan ahead now because I'm going to Germany yeah. uh, this weekend. So I had to plan ahead of what I usually did. So I, I filled it out 22 times on one day. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's crazy. It's, it's demanding of you in a way that isn't, that, that isn't really comparable to anything. I think yeah. like, I can't really compare like, Imagine filling out the same form 22 times, but coming up with different answers each time. It's, yeah. it's crazy. It is. Yeah. I mean, it, it sounds like it. We, um, I mean, I, th- I feel like the system might be somewhat similar in, in Denmark, but the way, so God, I have to translate all the fucking, the terms that I learned in university to English, and I've never heard the English words for these, but. So there is a... Throw them at us. Yes. So, so the standard form of teaching or to administer schools for a state, what we used to have was um, fuck, it was called uh, Regelstyrning, which means uh, control oh, so, or... Yeah, like rule governed. Yeah, like, like, yeah, governed by rules. Yeah. Which essentially meant that the the state, so the central state, because we used to have a centralized uh, and state-owned school system. Right. So the central state would come up with all of these things, like this is what, like this is what the students have to learn, and this is how you're going to teach it. These are the books that you have to use. These are the methods which you have to use in order for your students to learn these things. Mm-hmm. And so teachers were had very little freedom in how the students reached their goals. Uh, and then, right. you know, in, in the 60s, there was the, uh, the May Day riot things, whatever, in Paris, whatever they were called. They were like... like yeah, the 68 Rebellion stuff. I yes. don't know what it's called exactly. Uh, the student protests? Student protests, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. And that kind of, like, that kind of spread its way to Sweden, where a lot of left-wing... Like left-wing political parties and left-wing people and liberals and that kind of thing started to demand a decentralization of the school system. Autonomy. Autonomy, yes. 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 Uh, so autonomy for the teachers, which I can agree with, that that's good. But then also autonomy and decentralization of who runs the school uh, and who's allowed to run a school and that kind of thing. So the the schools went from being operated, owned and operated by the state to being owned and operated by the municipalities, which was a terrible idea. And I can't, I can't stress enough how much of a terrible that idea that was to let fucking Gunnar from Jönköping fucking control the education system of like thousands of kids. Like he's like a 58 year old steel welder from Blöschenblö. And he's now in charge of the schools. Like, why? Why can't we just have, you know, like proper politicians who are accountable in Stockholm? Actually, ugh, whatever. So, <laughs> um, so, so the municipalities are now the people who are in charge of the schools. So every municipality is different, and the the schools receive different amounts of money depending on which municipality is you are in. So depending on whether you're in a in a rich municipality or a poor municipality, the schools are either, are either shit or they're very good. So mm. that also sucks. 
But so yeah, it sounds like it's fucked. Yeah. So for teachers, we did get a lot more autonomy with this new decentralization thing. Oh, and also uh, private schools were introduced in the nineties. I was forget about that. So you can now have a private schools and charter schools. It's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting how different it is because I remember talking to you about this. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we talked about this on um, the podcast or just in person. I don't. I think it might have been in person. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like in Denmark, uh, schools. Uh, I think I feel like the school system is very different. Like there's some, yeah. um, there's, the, it's, it's a very hands off approach to what you talk about and how you teach it in Denmark, but you have to reach mm. some goals and the schools are run economically by the municipalities. And that's the way it's always been. Apparently I looked it up mm. and talked to some teachers about it. The state has never actually owned any school in Denmark. Um, I think, I think the, I mean, that sounds very similar to what we have. The, yeah, the, the schools are owned by the municipality, or they're private, or charter yes. schools. Or well, we've also always yeah. had private schools. I found out. Mm, yeah. So, we, but they they used to be mostly religious, the private schools. Yeah, and then um, in the seventies and eighties, there was an explosion of like um, exclusive private schools. Like there were obviously yeah. some aristocratic private schools in the eighteen hundreds, but. It, there was an, a popular kind of like explosion of Mensa type schools in mm. the 70s and 80s. And yeah. yeah, it sucks. Like I get so angry about it because the government supports these private schools a lot yeah. uh, with a lot of funds and they're very expensive to run and they're really draining the resources of the public school system. Mm. And it's not, I, I'm not a fan. I'm, I'm not a fan. And my, my brother, I'm sad to say, chose to put his, um, his daughter, my niece, in a private school, which is a, a very good school. And I'm not mad at him for doing it, but I'm mad at the system for essentially segregating um, students who are having a hard time and come from rough family environments yeah. from, uh, you know, students who come from um, academic homes because mm -hmm. like one of the essential goals of schooling is learning to uh, work with and recognize that people from all different types of families are you know human and yeah. it, it, it shouldn't be your socioeconomic background that determines whether you get a good education or not like no. that's just the and simple it, it is a very yeah. sad reality that if you are rich then your kids will have access to much better education than if you're poor oh yeah like my brother's my niece's school that she'll be starting in this summer um uh, has like a class size of 14 students and two teachers yeah. per, like per <laughs> class. So there are 14 students and two teachers teaching these 14 <laughs> students. Meanwhile, public schools are like 28 students in yes. a classroom with mm -hmm. one teacher. Yeah. I mean, like, that's just the sad. And, and I can't like, would you blame someone who had the means who had, you know, the choice between those two for putting his and his or her son or daughter or whatever no. in, in, I mean, in that classroom. No, I wouldn't because like, no. but it's just, it's, it sucks because if we didn't have the private school system, that is like, if we didn't have so many private schools, we could like the public school system could just look like that. Yeah. Like if all the funds that are going to private schools went into the public system, we could have public schools with 14 students per class and mm. two teachers in each. Like we absolutely could, yeah. but we can't because now it's just made in such a way that only the, the, you know, the parents that can afford uh, you know, hundreds and, you know, like thousands of dollars, like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year, they yeah. get the best education. And um, the people who come from like working back, working class background, middle class, even that can't afford it, they're just, you know, they get like a substandard, shameful excuse for an education where teachers have to work so hard and they do work really hard, but they work so hard to, to spite the conditions to give these children a decent education mm. like yeah i think i think public school teachers are like the you know they deserve all the praise in the world even if they're not doing a very good job like just for sticking in there and staying at that workplace and doing the best they can it's rough it's a really re like i can say i'm at a public school right now it's a rough environment for like students and teachers it really is yeah and i mean like if if one of those really fancy high paying private schools were to come to me and be like, hey, do you want to work here? You, you get to be responsible for like six kids. I mean, I, I wouldn't turn it down. Yeah, that's the thing too. Yeah. 
Like I can't, I can't reject the notion that maybe I would work for a private school simply for my own mental health too. Yeah. Is like, because when I hear about the conditions these teachers have in private schools, it sounds lovely. <laughs> like they have so much time to prepare. They yeah. get, you know, students that like, they, they, you get like the best students in terms of like engagement and, you know, students that come from an, from a family with academic backgrounds and, mm. but also it, I, I think like deep down I would feel dirty a little bit like it would be like working for the mob or something <laughs> yeah. because it's, it's yeah, like mean, you're cheating yeah. it's like it's it's not really like it's not the 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 down and dirty you know molding the brains of the future type work it's yeah. like training joseph kennedy's son to become president you know <laughs> is it, I mean, like these kids yeah, are going to be yeah. fine no matter what the children that go to those schools like they could just stare into the wall and they'll still go to like <laughs> i don't know they'll still get their poli sci education yeah yeah, no, I agree. It it does. It would feel like working for the mob. It would feel like you're getting an ex like a huge amount of money for doing something which might not be strictly ethical. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, but at the same time, like I can't blame any of the teachers that choose to do it. I read a very heartbreaking uh, 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 article from a, a school teacher who had been teaching for thirty five years who had a nervous breakdown working at a public mm. school in Denmark. Because he said it was too much. He had 350 different students and he couldn't sleep at night because he didn't know all their names. Yeah. And, you know, they keep changing. And he didn't have them in one of the main core subjects. So he didn't teach them in math or Danish, which are the two main subjects yeah. uh, that they have the most, most lessons in. And he felt so guilty because he'd been, you know, a teacher for so long and he still couldn't make himself remember all their names. And he felt really guilty that he couldn't reach all of them and he had to make promises to the parents that he couldn't keep. So that he, he literally had a nervous breakdown and he had to break his core principle and start working at a private school uh, because he, he just, he was recommended by his doctor that it would be too stressful to go back yeah. to a public school. And he was, he was so ashamed because he was uh, an ardent, I think either socialist or communist. I can't remember from the article. I don't want to misrepresent him, but mm -hmm. he really like corely believes in public education and everyone having access to the best education without having to go out of pocket for it. But he just—he said he had to realize that it's just simply not possible right now to give the kind of attention to students that he wants to give to students in the public school system, and mm. that is really depressing. We don't really have private schools in in Sweden, at least to that extent. We have like we have good public schools in in like good municipalities, and we have charter schools. Some of which, like some charter schools, are very nice. Some charter schools are really, really crappy. Uh, you know, it depends. It depends mostly on on the area, on the geographical area, and like the demographics of the people who live in that municipality. Right. Uh, and you know how how many how much tax income that municipality has, because that determines how much they can spend on the schools, which is such mm -hmm. a fucked up system. It's funny because like, what 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 really fascinated me when I. Like I've been involved in in youth politics in forever, and like yeah. obviously the main thing you talk about in youth politics is like education and you know the things that and glo like climate change, the type of stuff that uh, you can relate to the most, like the future of the world and education. Like th those mm -hmm. are those, I don't know if that's still the case, but those were like the two main things when I was mostly no, involved no, with youth politics. No, it's pretty much still the same, yeah. In my yeah. experience of youth politics. And like, I'm not knocking it. It makes total sense because it's the same thing when you grow up because then it becomes about work conditions and stuff. So I'm not, I'm not knocking it, yeah. but, um, yeah, like, uh, what, what really shocked me is just in Denmark, how much worse the schools are within like the, the, the diameter of, um, the biggest cities compared to out in the countryside, because, mm -hmm. um, there's so many old people. And, uh, and, and people who need, like, um, medical attention that the municipalities are paying for in those places. So they have to spend, I think, like, half of all the tax money in Copenhagen go purely to old people, their welfare, medication, that type of stuff. Mm. Like, that's, like, in incredible to think about that half their budget. Compared to, like, uh, the city I live in now, it's, like, 16% or, like, yeah. six, like 15%, 14%, something like that. And, and that, that is yeah. like the core, the core of my issues with decentralization and having like municipalities gather taxes and, and, and spend their taxes and, you know, 
create the public welfare in in their very local areas like mm. it's such like that problem would be non-existent if 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 it was a more centralized system with you know a state you know centralized taxes yeah i i do remember reading about how in back in olden times the government in denmark was responsible for hospitals and um mm. medical care throughout the whole country Mm-hmm. Now it's, of course, the, the municipalities. I think that, that was also in the 70s or 80s that that changed. Yeah. But yeah, it was, um, it, from what I could read, it was a lot cheaper to do it that way. Like it, it, because the, the government um, mandated it and governed it, it was easier for them to make sure that everyone had you know, access to the same type of health and that the, they, were, they were more able to monitor the hospitals and the way that they communicated with each other and they were able to implement technologies across all hospitals. But now mm. we have a problem that is that because the municipalities are governing the different hospitals, they use very different systems, like literally software systems and yeah. like different type of hearses and different types of ambulances. So the government is still paying for all this stuff, but they just have no right to tell them to stop spending money on stupid things. Like they can't, they can't make all the hospitals use the same internal system to deliver documents to each other. It's that type of stupid stuff that's just yeah. so expensive and bureaucratic. And like there was literally a case of, of a, uh, like a, a patient who went from one that they call super hospital, like the, the best hospitals in Denmark are called super hospitals, the biggest ones anyway. So they transferred one patient from one of them to the other, which was 50 kilometers away. And turned out they didn't use a single like similar software system. So they urgently needed information about this patient, but they couldn't open the files because like one hospital used Mac computers, the other used PC. Yeah. And then they used like one type of, I think they called, I think uh, one of the internal software systems used were called AULA and the other one was called CPSU or something like. It CPSU, was all- the Communist Party of the Soviet Union? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's called it's called something like com- com- computational. I don't know. It's probably not yeah. CPS, but you know what I mean. Like uh, it was just like runs, is it run by the CPSU. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the <laughs> Copenhagen hospital systems are run by the Communist Party of of, of Yeah, it's it's a bit consp- it's collusion. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but but you know what I mean. Like literally, nothing mm-hmm. could communicate with one another. Yeah. So this this patient, like the they had to after they exhausted all the options, they literally just called the other hospital and asked the doctors because. They, they couldn't they couldn't communicate with one another yeah. it's so like that would never happen back when the government arranged things when like because again they could just tell the hospitals use this system and they would have to use it but now because it of course is decentralized they all are free to use whatever system they want yeah. and yeah like democracy is good more democracy isn't necessarily better like mm-hmm. you said like sometimes it's best for people to just make a decision and then for everyone to fall in line Mm. Like if if you start voting on literally everything, because like you can, like you can take democracy out to such extreme <laughs> yeah, yeah. extents that you have to vote about like, uh, oh, okay, um, like what do we like? What kind of lunch do we offer patients on this in this wing on Wednesdays? Like it's just at some point someone has to you know just say let's just do this. Like that's just it's it's a waste of time at a certain point when something has so little importance that it really makes no sense to vote about it, but you still do because democracy like that, that seems nonsensical to me, uh, but that's what's going on right now. People are voting about literally everything you know, like locally, and there's no communication between the other hospitals or the other healthcare providers. And it's just like, it, it doesn't matter if it's super expensive because they're not paying for it anyway. It's the government that's still paying for it. Yeah. So it's just a giant headache and it's so expensive for the municipalities. And it, it like, it directly hurts education and it hurts all these other sectors, culture, uh, restoration of old buildings, sanitation, you name it. Like yeah. these, these miscommunications and isolations of, of, of healthcare is like there's such a big management problem with it and it's, it's directly affecting. And as a result, anyway, the conclusion of what I was saying, as a result, schools in big cities in Denmark are much worse than mm. um, rural and suburban schools. Um, um, by metrics and by quality of like rooms and environment yeah. and stuff. And obviously, like, I don't just want faceless politicians to decide 
everything without consulting the people or, or relating to the people no, or being accountable no, no. to the people. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. No, yeah. that's that's not at all what I'm getting from what we're... I, I'm sure people are going to hear that, but that's not what we're saying. Mm. And one of the main things that I'm scared of when it comes to centralization is that it's going to also lead to politicians because they have the entry point that they're also going to say, you can teach this in, in this subject and you can't teach this in this subject. You know what I mean? Mm. Like there's going to be more of a curated... Because that's what you saw in Australia, for instance. Like mm -hmm. in Australia, you have, they all use the same books. You know, you're, you're issued books that mm -hmm. you have to teach students. And that was pretty much a consequence of them centralizing schools under the authority of the government, which yeah. a lot of teachers wanted. But then it also meant, you know, okay, we're going to run it. But that also means, like for political points, they're going to say, we're not going to teach about Aboriginal history because blah, 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 yeah, or whatever, yeah. you know? Like that would like, be really problematic yeah. if, if it came to that point. But I don't I, think, I think it necessarily like has to. Like when decentralization happened, there were the, like there were three main consequences of the decentralization movement. The first one was autonomy for the teachers. That is mm. good. I like the yes. autonomy for the teachers. Teachers yes. are given very clear goals. Like this is what your students need to know when you're done teaching them things. Everything else is up to you, and I think that's a very good system. The I other agree. two consequences were not so good. The first one is the one I talked about. Municipalities are given basically all the authority to run the schools and fund the schools and gather the taxes for the schools and the state isn't involved there at all. And then the, the third consequence was uh, you, now private individuals are allowed to open up schools and run schools basically how they see fit. And those can be religious schools. We didn't really have religious schools before decentralization and, and the you know allowing people to open charter schools. But now we have both Christian, um, Christian charter schools and uh, Islamic charter schools, which have received a lot of criticism, especially from, from the right, but also from the left, because right. they teach kids some questionable things. Um, you know, not, not, you know, nothing against Islam in and of itself, but uh, those schools in specific, specifically have, and I mean, probably the Christians want to, uh, I don't really know. But they have the Christian like, ones in Denmark have a reputation for being very strict, but also very scared strict, of yeah. of being reported. So like they're very uh, like uh, yeah, they use very old fashioned teaching methods, but they yes. are very sure to go through all the didactic needs of mm. set up by the government. So they can't be reported for not giving a good enough education. They can only be reported for being maybe too strict. Yeah, no, I mean I'm uh, sure yeah. that the, the the educational part is fine in the charter schools, yeah. but. What they've been criticized for is that they have, I think in, in one instance, there was a school, I think it was an Islamic, uh, Islamic uh, charter school, so it was, a, you know, like a privately run by a single guy who owned it. Um, and they had like this rule where boys were not allowed to sit next to girls in class. Yes. Yep. And that, uh, they were reported and they were found, uh, like the state came down and said like, that's. That goes wildly against the like the central, because uh, schools in Sweden have like these two values, I guess you could say. All schools and all teachers have to follow, and that is primarily the, or or, or firstly, it is the uh, to what's it called to foster or to bring up democratic citizens. And yes, that one was. Um, it's called uh, Bildung in German, mm. like Bildung, where it's like uh, the moral education or the, yeah. it, it, the it, ethical it came, education. Um, it came in the 50s after World War II because yeah. the state saw it necessary to educate people to not become Nazis, basically. <laughs> yes, yeah. We had a very, a very prominent figure in Denmark called Hal Koch, mm. who was, uh, uh, yeah, he was very inspired by um, the... Voltaire's of the world about how we should educate people to be critical. Like it's basically like early postmodernist thought. Yeah, to be um, to be critical and democratically minded, living democratically yeah, was yeah, his yeah. saying. Yeah, to be able to like uh, get along with everyone, be able to uh, you know reach some kind of consensus, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then the the second value that all schools and all teachers have to abide by and instill in their students is what's called alla um, menneskers lika färde which means all peoples or all humans equal value, mm. uh, which it, it, 
it's like a catch-all to mean don't teach sexism or homophobia or racism that people are equally worth regardless of their race or sex or gender or sexual identities and etc cetera, etc cetera. that's all, interesting yeah. because that's a split from us because we had more of a an approach that was that if you like it's literally like um i guess like a steven crowder method where it's like if you like our approach was living democratically means debating something uh, to its mm. natural conclusion so it means like debating a topic into ridiculous like ridicule essentially so mm -hmm. it's like if you have a nazi student who says something nazi your job is to say so what about this and what about uh, like through like rationality uh beat the nazism out of them essentially <laughs> like to just mm -hmm. like your job as a teacher is to, to to keep posing hypotheticals until they're ridiculed essentially so like forcing them to defend their beliefs uh and think more about what they believe essentially that sounds like a fucking traumatizing situation to be in like just imagining that i was that person oh yeah oh yeah just, like, it's yeah it, yeah, yeah. Just, but they also I, they're supposed to also do it to communists Yes. To say like so, I, so I if you're just if, gonna say, because yeah. my my teachers knew that I was a communist, I was a member of a communist youth organization, and mm -hmm. like they didn't they didn't try to beat the commie out of me, they didn't try to argue with me. They're like, oh, well, what about this? What about that? I mean, they mostly like they made some jokes, some light quips, um, and like we were friendly about it, and and they were quite you know fine with me. Oh, yeah, um, your job isn't to make them uncomfortable. Your job is, I guess, to like the main thing that that we're being told in practice is you need to challenge them more mm -hmm. it's like if you have someone who has very spicy yeah, beliefs yeah, yeah. your thing is to be like you keep asking them questions uh for their rationality to get them to reflect over what they believe and then maybe I mean, realize yeah. that you know there's some things they haven't taken into consideration and all that. that that's sort of true here as well but it's not about like drilling them or asking them a bunch of questions but it's more through in various ways, like subtly in different, like over the course of time, trying to get them to see things from different perspectives. So, for instance, uh, my teachers all knew that I was a communist. And mm -hmm. so when we had our United Nations role play thing, which, uh, which we had in our, I believe, first year or second year, well, whatever. Uh -huh. um, well, you know, we, we would be in groups of like three or four and we would have a country and we would debate something in like a United Nations assembly or whatever. Um, yeah. So my, because my teachers knew that I was a communist, they put me in the United States group in order for me, because then I would have to argue things from the American perspective, from the perspective mm -hmm. of, you know, American imperialism. And, you know, live like live into that role and truly believe that that is what was good etc and yeah uh, you know yeah. as a way to challenge my views and then get me to see things from different perspectives and i think that that's a perfectly natural thing to do um like like i like if they had put me in like cuba or vietnam or something that wouldn't really have taught me anything that would have just been like fun for me i think yeah, yeah, I get like, but that's that's the. I'm not saying it's it's it's. I'm not giving a value judgment. Is it? I'm not giving a normative like I like this. But that's that's the point of of Hal Cox approach. Anyway, it was it was yeah. very like. Um, you need to. What was it? it? It's it's essentially the. Um, no speech is banned, and it's good that you have a controversial opinion because rational like. He was he was very idealistic in the sense that it was he believed that humanity was essentially like democratic and egalitarian, uh, but it was through misunderstanding that people uh, became fascists or as he saw it communists, which he mm -hmm. equated fascists, communists, Nazis. He said that um, that he essentially wanted everyone to become uh, benevolent centrists who <laughs> yeah. like um, would live in modern society, postmodern, I guess, without knowing it, uh, society, um, and kind of contribute their part to uh, liberal society progressing into a kinder direction. Like he was, mm -hmm. he was a Christian and a theologist too, but he was, he was very well liked. And uh, he, he, I don't know, like he was a well-meaning liberal 
who you know said the only way that we can combat nazism which is the time he he existed in is to make people more democratic and discuss things more and not mm-hmm. exclude speech which i guess is a logical conclusion for someone to make who's also like a a well-meaning theologian um mm-hmm. immediately following the second world war is what why did you know the the nazis excluded speech let's have all the speech you know <laughs> yeah like that's going to solve it but uh, yeah like someone being a nazi in and of itself i think isn't i mean isn't a uh, a problem here um uh, like obviously you would want them to see things from different perspectives and and you would challenge them in various ways but you do that with all of the students if any student you have has like a conviction whatever it is you want to try to challenge it and you want to them to think rationally and analyze and reflect on different positions and not just uh, only ever see things from the pers- perspective they already have but mm. it becomes more problematic when the student who holds nazi or fascistic views starts to talk about people of different races or sexualities or whatever in class, especially if there is someone in that class who he is talking about in a negative way. Like, Mm -hmm. if you have a Muslim in your class and the Nazi student starts talking about how Muslims are this and that, then that becomes a problem which the school has to deal with. Uh, and it's no, not just like a fun, oh, we have different opinions, let's challenge each other thing. Mm. Uh, it becomes an actual problem of harassment or, um, I don't know what the word is in, in, in English, but there's a, a free speech law in Sweden, which is like um, threats against uh, people groups. Yeah, yeah, harassment, I guess. Is yeah. The, or like, yeah. I, I, we have a similar one, yeah. No, I'm, of course, if the student is going around bullying or taking out anything on people who are different, uh, mm. then obviously that would be escalated. That's not, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But but uh, I'm more talking about if they hold the opinions in themselves um, and believe it to be true, uh, then you the way you go about it is to challenge it. Yeah. In, in, like not report the the student but to to get them to to, to reflect and mm-hmm. because the, the the core belief is that for any change to be meaningful in the student the, the the best way to to go about it is that they should it should come from within like they should realize yeah. that oh okay this this didn't hold up let's move on to a different belief system essentially mm-hmm. but obviously if that doesn't work then you escalate it because you don't you don't want it to turn into like some kind of you know you don't want it to turn into expressions of violence or bullying or yeah, yeah that type of stuff. That's that's not uh, permitted or yeah, mm-hmm. in any way encouraged. Um, but it's tough, man. It's tough to get yeah. kids to believe anything. Like it's tough to get <laughs> like yeah. you you can tell them something and their 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 first reaction is always like why like what what blah. it's always like this this dejected like blah, blah. like you remember it from being kids too like your your instinct yeah. was the teacher is the enemy the teacher is the the authority you want to rebel against this person like how do you get how do you twist that like uh impression in someone's mind to be like no 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 i'm actually a really cool dude who wants to teach you about like uh uh a reflection or something yeah. they're going to be like no i want to play video games like yeah. obviously you want like and and like I of course play video like, games too honestly Exactly. Yeah, the that's time the thing. When is I'm in school, I'm thinking, man, I want to be home playing video games for now. Me too. Like, I'm, I'm thinking, like, I have a really good book at home. I would so much mm-hmm. rather be reading this book. But you're doing this thing, and like, so you get it. Like, whenever I see kids who are just like, I don't want to read this. My, my main instinct is just to go up to them and go, like, I wouldn't want to either. Yeah. Like this is, but, but like, how do you twist? How do you turn that around? Is the, the, the like it, it's it challenging? It's problematic you know? because in in most schools there is. There are rules that are essential that that essentially say, uh, you are the role model of kids. Yes. You're something mm-hmm. someone who they should look up to. You're not yes. their friend. Mm-hmm. Uh, so being like saying something like, Oh yeah, no, a man, I get it. I wouldn't if I were in your shoes, I wouldn't want to read this thing either. Schools like principals might look at that and be like, You're mm, you're being a little bit too 
relatable <laughs> to them. or i don't yeah. know i don't know it's, yeah. no I you're absolutely it. right and it you know if you relatable. teach for a while you notice that what you're saying is true too but it's like today just today uh my buddy was teaching something and as a way of getting people to pay attention he snapped his fingers and said like hey to get their attention and everyone yeah. looked up and they were like no one's done that before and then the next 10 minutes of class was just people quietly trying to make the same snapping noise with their <laughs> fingers because they were like this guy rules like i've never seen anyone get my attention like that i'm going to be able to do that too i'm going to learn to snap like him when i grow up and be cool it's like mm-hmm. yes you are like a, a a role model to these young children or like these i don't know young whatever but like to to, to like as a teacher you are like a role model mm-hmm. and sometimes you forget how much attention you're getting in the minds of these people because you're just going through something yeah. but they like they think everything about you and you are literally like who like Foucault said that you're literally like a, a their current or their you know uh prison warden for the time being like you're you're literally like stealing their time right like they don't have the choice to just get up and leave i guess technically they do but they don't because like mm-hmm. they have to be there to not be poor in 10 years mm-hmm Anyway, I think we have to wrap it up soon. Um, yes. <laughs> I have to get something to eat. Yeah. Um, this episode of Shit Island is brought to you by our lovely patrons over on patreon.com forward slash Ashley Scapegoat. Uh, so the, the money that you send in to Patreon, Peter and I split it up 50-50. I sent him his half uh, like last month or whatever it was. Every now and then when the pot gets... To a certain size, we split it in twain, and I send it off to Peter, because you know this is a joint effort. Yeah, and I mean it's it's great to uh, it's it's great to know that it's it's appreciated and that some people do listen and do like it. Uh, always, you know, grab a hold of us if there's a, if there's something you'd like us to discuss, uh, unless it's some country in Asia specific communist <laughs> development, because we don't know anything about it and it would be uncomfortable for two guys from Scandinavia to discuss it. But if yeah. you have like a, a broad topic <laughs> or something, we'd be more than, than willing to listen. And, uh, yeah, no, seriously, it's a giant help with both students. We both, you know, money is definitely, uh, a, a very, very important and valuable thing to us right now because we don't have any of it. And uh, we'd like some to survive. So we really do appreciate your support. And we hope that you'll continue to do so. There's just been like, uh, Goat, you just introduced some new Patreon tiers, right? I, I did just introduce some new Patreon tiers. And there's a, there's a, you can go to the Patreon and you can see there's a few new tiers. Or, well, it's the same tiers, but they've changed. So um, I, I've sort of, they're themed around, um, you know, the, the hypo or the hypothetical political party of Ashuristan, the Ashur Skipko political party. Um, and so I think it's fun. I think it's fun. Yeah, it's so, cool. And then, yeah, you get you get some benefits if you're on a discord server or if you interact mm-hmm. with us. That would be cool. Yeah, you, you get to be on the on the discord server. I mean, you get to be in the discord server anyway, but you get you get a name, you get a role with a with a pink name. Depending on which tier you have, you get a different shade of pink, uh, and you also get uh, if you donate five dollars or more, then you can get a party membership card, which I've made, which is like a, it's like a little uh, one of those old membership books which you got in the Soviet Union when you were a member of the Communist Party. You got like this little book that's like has some text in it, and then it has your name and stuff, and it has a membership ID, so. Everyone who donates five dollars or more, they get a little membership book um, with a unique membership ID. And uh, I would ship it to you if I had money or a way to ship it to you. But <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's digital; it's in a PDF format for now. But you know, go to your local library and print it out, and you can have it. And that'll be fun. Remember libraries. <laughs> Remember libraries. They still exist. They're still around. <laughs> They um, are, yeah, and they're actually really fun now. They've introduced a bunch of new technology there. It's great. Yeah. They um, really would appreciate you stopping yeah. by. I've heard that there are more than 100 books. Yeah, me too. Like, the, mm. they have more than one shelf for books yeah. now. It's crazy. Um, I don't know what they're about, but I've heard that there are plenty of them. Yeah. You know. I mean, there's, there's at least been written 100 books. It's crazy to think about. 
throughout time in, yeah. in different languages. Yeah, at least yeah. maybe some more. S- some books are about things that didn't even happen, but just some crazy person dreamt up. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. Anyway, that is that is like <laughs> how do you even do that? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if you go to to patreon.com forward slash Asher Scapegoat, you can get some benefits, and you can also listen to your name be read on on the podcast or in a video of mine, which I'm gonna do now. Thank you to Joshua Cheeseman, to Dunk Junk Funk, OC Sabo Kitty, M Lim, Nyin Chan Min, John H N, Michael Rook. L or EIL, a capital L and or the lowercase L and capital I, difficult to distinguish there. Jedi Davian, Quagram, Gekobite, and Emil Segerbeck. Thank you. You are the real OGs. <laughs> you are the real OGs. And, um, and what's that old meme? You're the man now, dog? Wasn't that a meme? Sh- Sean Connery saying, You're the man now, dog. Uh, in in like two thousand eight, what do you? <laughs> no, this is way before that. Oh. Did, don't you know that? Like before YouTube, there was a a, a website called ytmdn dot com or something uh, where people yes. could upload oh. short flash animations, and mm. they would. Uh, yeah, I'm old. <laughs> no, I, I know what you're talking about. I just I haven't heard that specific <laughs> meme. I don't think. You're the man now, dog. I'll just be repeating anyway. <laughs> It's from thank some you. movie, Saving Forest or something. Anyway, thank you, patrons. <laughs> thank you, patrons. Um, if you want to send us an email, you can do so. Uh, you can send it to shitislandshow at gmail.com. One of these days, we're going to go through them. Um, yeah. It's not today. Eventually. So just keep sending those emails. <laughs> we'll get to you eventually. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter. You can follow... Us personally on Twitter, I'm at Ashier underscore scapegoat because my Twitter, my old Twitter account was suspended. That's a long story. And Peter is at the Peter Road. Is that right? Oh, great question. I wasn't prepared for this question. No, uh, uh, let me just find yes, it. It's okay. sla- uh, it's at the Peter Rhodes. Yes, that's me. I thought it might have been just Peter Rhodes, but no, no, I'm, was no that was good. taken. That's right. Yeah, so I was. It's a diss to the person who took Peter Rhodes. It's like uh-huh. the Peter Rhodes. That's me. Yeah. Um, and you can also follow the show itself. It's at Shit Island Show. And we'll post yeah. links to the episodes and related things on there sometimes, maybe. Yeah, it's a, it's a good follow. But yes. And be sure to, to give us all the ratings. Oh, yeah. Can people even rate us if we're not on iTunes? Uh, I think they can rate us on Stitcher. Oh, we're on Stitcher. That's right. Where the yes. cool podcasts hang out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't think anyone <laughs> listens. To- if you listen to us on Stitcher, let us know. Yeah, do. I don't <laughs> know how many people again. actually. A lot of people probably use Stitcher, right? No idea. Yeah, no clue. I but just yeah, upload I, yeah. the things to there. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Uh, rate us there. Give us a like. Give us a heart. Whatever you do on Stitcher. Yeah, thank it's you great. for supporting the show and for yes. letting us do this. Yeah, uh, spread the word. <laughs> <laughs> Call to action. Uh, do print, the thing. Uh, make posters <laughs> and print them out and put them up around your town and in your university campus. Yeah, tell them to to watch or listen to Shit Island. It's yeah, it's difficult be... to watch it. <laughs> you have to try really hard to watch yeah. it. Yeah, you can. You, well, you can visualize. It's like what yeah. we were talking about with radio earlier. You can Oh yeah, it it's theater of the mind. Yeah, just yeah. close your eyes, imagine two boring guys talking to just <laughs> <laughs> No I'm kidding. Yeah. We're very interesting people, I mm. guess. Yes. No. Maybe. Uh, we lead no. very interesting lives. Today oh, yeah. I had Choco Flakes. Oh cool. You know what I bought today? I bought bl- brain blasters candy with a Z <laughs> instead of an S. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you. It's for almost too exciting. Episode. Thank you for listening to this episode. Uh, it's been fun. We'll Bye. see you in the next one. Oh yeah, we will. Look out for it on the internet. That's where it'll be. Don't look for it on the radio. We're not on there. <laughs> I want to be on the radio. I want this show to to to, to only go out on some <laughs> local Belgian radio station. <laughs>
<laughs> we just fucking stop being on the internet and we just exclusively become a radio show in Belgium. Just in Belgium. Yeah. I want I want to go to some obscure Belgian town with 5,000 people living in it and be a huge celebrity. Because <laughs> I'm the only one being on the radio with you. just become the co-mayors of the city in Belgium. Some mountain mm. city. Do they have mountains in Belgium? No. Ah. Some, some, some agrarian society. We just go there and it's just like a bunch of uh, farmers who love us. Yeah. That would be awesome. And would they? <laughs> would they? <laughs> <laughs> Stop broadcasting in our town. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know if, if we appeal, if the demographic we appeal to is Belgian farmers. It, it will be. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll set up a ham radio that just blocks all the signals to every, to every radio station and just set up our own that just 24 hours a day does these shows on repeat. Nice. All right. So look out all for right. us on Belgian radio. Yes. Local radio. We're not going to be nationwide. Yeah, nominate, nominate your, your uh, Belgian city that we're going to invade yeah. uh, with our ham radio set uh, in the comments or send us an email. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you for listening.